In 2010, when Shah Faisal became the first Kashmiri to top the IAS exam, he was celebrated. A beacon of hope, a brilliant Kashmiri who had put his faith in the Indian state. He was feted and held up as a role model to young Kashmiris. Ten years later, it's a completely different story. He's quit the IAS and he wants to use electoral politics to get India to prioritize a resolution to the Kashmir issue. An issue which was spotlighted in devastating manner on February 14th when a young Kashmiri suicide bomber killed 40 CRPF men and left many others injured. To assess the impact of this on Kashmir and Kashmiris living across the country, my off-centre conversation today is with Shah Faisal. Thank you for talking to us. We are speaking in the backdrop of this tragedy that's playing out even as we speak across the country. What was your first reaction when you heard about this news of the CRPF convoy being targeted? Uh, it has been a devastating experience okay. for me personally. Uh, I am somebody who, who has been in the field for quite some time and we have been hearing the news of encounters, deaths and killings almost on a, on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. But when I heard that an, ex, an, 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 ex, an incident of this magnitude has happened, believe me, uh, it made me feel that something sinister is going to follow and mm -hmm. I was totally in shock. It was a suicide bombing. We had not heard of this something and for me, who has been kind of looking at the security situation, it's like a watershed moment mm. for Kashmir and for the rest of the country. What is interesting for me to hear is that you're calling it a watershed moment. It's a turning point in so many ways. One, we have never seen an incident of this magnitude, this many killings happening in one incident in the last 30 years. That makes it unprecedented. Second, the way in which it happened. You had a Kashmiri carrying an explosively, explosive laden van and then hitting it on a target. This has never happened. Kashmiris are the people who till 10, 20 years back, they would hire somebody to kill their chicken. This is a community about which for the last couple of hundreds of years, people have been saying that they cannot even hurt an insect. And now you have the same Kashmiri guy a youngster who is, I mean, in his teenage, uh, who's just crossed his teenage, he's doing a deadly attack. He's doing a deadly attack like that. This is unprecedented. So when you saw that video message that Adil Ahmad Dar put out, when he says he should be seen as a martyr for Islam, uh, he's been quoted as saying the war that they can't win with force. They're trying to win by compromising your belief. They want to mislead you from the etiquettes of Islam. They want to mislead you from the path of Islam by luring you with worldly pleasures. What do you think he means and what is he talking about? Uh, and this idea of jihad and the Islam, Islamic war, Absolutely. holy war against India. This is not the idea of self-determination that someone like you has talked about in the that, recent past. That messaging is extremely worrisome. And how I look at it is hmm. what has happened, you know, how, how it has come, up, come about. And uh, we're using religion hmm. as a source of motivation hmm. to do incidents like this. When we talk about radicalization, hmm. I have been in the field. I have yeah. seen these youngsters, yeah. you know, doing all these stuff. Is there anything in your experience yeah, that prepares yeah, yeah. you for this, Absolutely. this motivation Absolutely. and this action as Absolutely. a result of this so motivation? I'm saying, you know, what happens when conflict lands youngsters into a state of absolute despair? Hmm. What kind of support system then religion, then faith, then society comes up with? So here in this case, radicalization as a consequence or radicalization as a cause? Suicide bombing, what should be the kind of motivations that can lead somebody to do a suicide bombing? Nothing beyond, nothing, nothing lesser than religion, nothing lesser than possibly imagining that the rewards for such an act are going to be huge. That's what worries me. That something which started purely for enforcement of political rights mm. has the potential of deviating into a territory which is going to be extremely dangerous, not just for Kashmir, not just for the rest of the country, for the entire South Asia. Mm. I'm saying that what begins, what began rather, with a simple agitation, with a simple crisis related to political rights of people, what kind of things then it can degenerate into, that danger we saw in that speech. 
you're saying this is a degeneration of what Kashmiris have been articulating as their cause? It is absolute degeneration because we cannot afford hmm. to frame hmm. the argument that Kashmir is about in religious terms. Because it's finally not about Kashmiri Muslims only. It's about Kashmiri Pandits as well. Kashmiri Pandits are one of the fundamental and most important stakeholders of Kashmir. We have other regions. We have Jammu. We have Ladakh, Ladakh where is, which is predominantly Buddhist. So we have other stakeholders. We have Sikhs. We have Christians. So fundamentally, if you try to frame Kashmiri argument in a religious kind of uh, picture, then it's totally devastating. You said it could be the cause or the consequence. Which one would you assess it I to be? I see radicalization as a consequence. Where does the religion come from? Hmm. Religion comes from when there is political vacuum in the place. Hmm. What kind of things can then fill that vacuum is, firstly, it's the religion. It's the extremist or maybe hardcore hmm. ideologies which hmm. come in hmm. and then substitute for the loss of or, or withdrawal of politics. In Kashmir, I can assure you that if political process gets revived, we'll see a drastic change in the way conflict is represented. You're talking about the political process being revived. Do you mean an elected government? Because we had one. We and had it didn't one. result Why didn't in it anything work? much. Why didn't, it didn't that elected government work? Term. So because the, fundam the, the basic argument which we now need to re-examine is that are elections the solution? Or are elections the solution in the format they are conducted? Are elections an endorsement of the status quo? Hmm. Or are elections something which we need to re-examine and re-secrutinize that kind of argument? We saw an elected government was formed in the state. It lasted for three years. We had an overwhelming mandate, around 70 to 80 percent voting happening in 2014 and 15. And in 2018, three years down the line, by polls, the municipal there elections, there is absolute by uh, yeah, complete by boycott. And today, it's very hard for us to even conduct elections in the state. So, in that context, Shah Faisal, how do you see the choice you are making, and that is to use electoral politics? And yet, I'm confused about how you're planning to use it because Absolutely. you do want to use it, uh, but you're saying that the way it has been used so far hasn't worked what and has, has been rejected. What has happened in the last four years? And Radha is that there is demise of politics in the state. Hmm. There was an important space which was occupied by a certain political party. I do not want to name that political party. That party engaged into an electoral alliance hmm. with a politically and ideologically totally opposite political party. Hmm. Hmm. Initially, everybody thought that coming together of these opposite polarities would possibly ha help Kashmir. But there was a widespread sentiment in the ground mm. which predicted that this is going to lead to a disaster mm. because that constituency of people mm. which associated with that political party, which was more towards the soft separatist side, which talked about the aspirations, which talked about the resolution of Kashmir issue, mm. which didn't have baggage. Mm. The biggest thing was that it didn't have legacy issues. Yeah. That politics got, you know, that got decimated mm. the day that collision happened. Mm. Hmm. And what happened because of that is that we had a huge number of people, mostly youngsters, hmm. who got politically de-anchored. You'll tell me how. Hmm. They do not relate to any other political ideology. This political party had occupied a very unique space hmm. in Kashmir's political kind of so landscape. So you don't name it, but it's the PDP that you're referring to, for my understanding? For me, it's about the space. Hmm. So my point is that that space, hmm. it was a very, very dangerous experiment mm. that that space was left abandoned mm. and we got into power politics just for the sake of power and chair and we saw three years down the line mm. we saw three years of crisis and we saw that crisis escalating to a level mm. where you have an unprecedented level of violence happening in the state. 2018 was one of the deadliest years in the last one decade. You don't think the other mainstream party, the National Conference, can can do this job effectively, can reach out to the people? Because Ev you've talked to the National yeah, absolutely. Conference. Ev you have considered the idea of joining them. You met Omar Abdullah. Uh, why is it that you don't see this party as providing an option? Every political party is catering to a section of public opinion in Kashmir. Hmm. I believe every political party is important. Hmm. 
But when it comes to providing solutions and catering to a constituency which does not relate to anybody, hmm. which does not relate to anybody, hmm. because they first question your legacy issues. Hmm. They tell you what happened in 1947, hmm. what happened in 1953, what happened in 1983, what happened in 1987, what about 1989, hmm. what about 1996. So this constituency asks questions. And then they know who are responsible for all these things which have happened in the past. And this constituency doesn't, doesn't, doesn't feel like engaging with anybody. So what do we do? That's why I said we need to reimagine Kashmiri politics. How are you going to present a convincing alternative? Or how are you going to reimagine this vacuum as you're calling, uh, calling it? Uh, my belief... Am I looking as skeptical as no, I'm I, sounding? You do, you do. Because it's very hard to be optimistic at a place like Kashmir where everything seems to be you know, going uh, just bonkers and nothing is working. Hmm. Uh, but for me, it's about maintaining that optimism, about continuously giving hope to people. Because what do we do then? Do we stay home and die? And do all of us wait for our doomsday? Hmm. That's not going to happen. Uh, my belief is that we need to enlarge the democratic space in Kashmir. What does that mean? Yeah, what does that mean? What does that mean? Uh, a lot of Kashmir management is about managing the political spaces. Hmm. What are the political spaces? Hmm. So you have a space which has been occupied by people who do not believe in the constitution. Hmm. Do you acknowledge that space? Do you deny it? I acknowledge it. I say, if you want to go for a solution, first thing is that you acknowledge that there's a space, there's a constituency, which doesn't believe in the constitutional way hmm. of resolution. Hmm. Let's talk to them. They are very important stakeholders. Hmm. Hmm. There's a space which has been occupied by traditional parties, hmm. which in spite of legacy issues, which in spite of having been in the state for many, many years, hmm. they're also holding on to a certain constituency. Right. Let's realize that they also have their own importance. Hmm. Hmm. But then also do something hmm. for those people who have a strong faith in the political aspirations hmm. and who do not see elections as a way of resolution. They see it as governance, administration. They see elections one, hmm. that if at all elections are to be done, then elections should be a way of getting good governance, number one. And elections should not be seen as betrayal hmm. of the sacrifices of the people. Hmm. 100,000 people have died hmm. in Kashmir hmm. on both sides of the ideological divide. People are saying that if you tell us that elections mean endorsement, hmm. it means moving on, it means forgetting and giving up. Hmm we are not going to participate mm. in the elections. So my argument to them is that elections can be, this electoral space can be very creatively used for engaging with the Indian state. Mm. Mm. When we go for elections, when I want to participate in the elections, what I'm saying is that I will be first acknowledging the existence of those political spaces, which are kind of the custodians of the sentiment custodians of the aspirations. So, okay. So there are several points you've made here. Let me first pick up this one about engaging with everybody and all kinds of stakeholders. So when you talk about people who don't believe in the Indian constitution, you are talking about the separatists, you're talking about the Hurriyat. Uh, absolutely. And you referred to them as the guardians of the sentiment, of Kashmiri sentiment. What does that mean? Does that mean that politically you, Shah Faisal, the individual, believe in a, in, in, in their ideology, in their philosophy of a separate state of Kashmir? What is it that you believe in? So I am talking about a position, about a political position. I am saying that separatists have not been participating in the electoral process. Right. Because they say that we have done it once. Hmm. Mr. Gilani has fought three elections. Hmm. Hmm. They say that after 1987, hmm. it makes absolutely no sense. Yeah participating in an electoral process which is not fair. Hmm. What do you do with that argument? Hmm. So people have experimented, they have engaged once. Hmm. So they are not ready to engage anymore. Hmm. So I am saying that let's respect their position. Hmm. And what choices do we have? Do we go out for a war with them? Or do we engage with them? Hmm. Do we acknowledge them? Hmm. Or do we deny their existence? If we deny their existence that they are hmm. representing the sentiment, hmm. look, Mainstream politicians have been time and again saying mm. that we are not representing the sentiment. Then who is representing the sentiment? Mm. Who does the stone pelter? Who does the youngster who is on boycott? Who does he listen to? Mm. Why don't our MLAs go out in the field? Mm. Why doesn't our minister face crowds in the, in the Kashmir Valley? So I get this. 
what is your position? My position is that there is a constituency in Kashmir which is not ready to exchange or swap aspirations for grievances. Hmm. They are saying that we are going to suffer under development. Hmm. I know people who have done PhDs, hmm. but they have not taken government jobs. You know why? Hmm. They are saying this is a compromise on our position vis-a-vis -vis Kashmir. We do not want to engage with the Indian state in any manner. Hmm. So my point is that you have to acknowledge the existence of this constituency, that there is a sentiment in Kashmir. Is that sentiment for separation? Is that sentiment for plebiscite? Is that sentiment for autonomy? Is that for right to self-determination? That's for us to later on discuss. I ask you again, what is your sentiment? My sentiment is that Kashmir has a history. Hmm. It's a political issue, which is not something which has been created in my lifetime. Sure. It has been there for 1940, since 1947. A couple of hours back, you had the premier, the prime minister mm. of a nuclear state mm. talking about Kashmir. Mm. You have somebody, another nuclear neighbor, a giant in our region, he's blocking our efforts to get somebody mm. notified in the United Nations. Who are these people? What the hell are they doing? Mm. If this is India's internal matter, if this is our domestic issue, who are these people? Why are these nuclear powers kind of interfering in our own matters? Mm. So that's what I'm saying that Kashmir is not a normal state. Sure. My position is that Kashmir is not Haryana, it is not Punjab, it's not Chhattisgarh. It's not Manipur. Mm. It's a very unique situation which, which we are in. It's a problem which has been there since 1947. And we need, it's a political issue. It's an issue of rights. We entered into a Hmm. into an arrangement with the Union of India in 1947. Hmm. That arrangement is itself disputed. But I am saying that, are we ready to agree to the conditions hmm. under which those arrangements were made? What happened to those conditions? What happened to those promises which were made to people? Today when I hmm. go to Kashmiris, hmm. Kashmiris tell me that, do you deny our history? When somebody says that there is no problem in Kashmir, people ask me, come on, are you being honest? What happened in the last 70 years? You're not saying it in so many words, but what your stance is is, is clear to anybody who's listening carefully, Shah Fezal. My stance is that Kashmir and Union of India is in a very unique relationship. Hmm. That unique relationship needs to be respected. Hmm. If something has been done to dilute hmm. that relationship, that needs to be restored. Hmm. And we need to listen to those voices hmm. who do not necessarily agree hmm. to resolution within the constitutional framework. That's my position. I'm representing all sets of opinions which are in Kashmir. Given that we are talking after this massive attack on India's uh, paramilitary forces. forces, security forces, do you see this conversation taking into account people who don't accept the constitution, the separatists and having engaging with all political stakeholders as a possibility? How I see is that we need to look at the loss of life. I mean, this has been such a devastating tragedy for the country. How many such incidents are we ready to accept hmm. in coming days? Hmm. I told you it's a crossing of Rubicon for Kashmir, hmm. for Kashmiris, for Kashmiri yeah. youngsters. Yeah. What are the options with us? Hmm. The options with Indian state are that it goes for a full-fledged war. Hmm. Can it go for one more war? Three wars have already been fought. We have seen surgical strikes. Have, have they done anything? Mm. So that's why when somebody like me talks about those old cliched mm. ideas about dialogue, about conversations, about you know talking to each other, it sounds kind of crazy at this moment when we are in such a stage of mourning. But finally, these are the conversations which need, which need to be picked up. Let me ask you about something you wrote in journalist Nidhi Razdan's book a few years ago. Okay, I'm going to quote a little bit. Uh, it was very lucidly written, very emotionally written. You were talking about your father's death, your father who had been killed by unidentified gunmen. You said, and I quote, he had religiously followed the survival manual for bystanders. He was anonymous. He had no opinion on anything overtly political. And he was a very ordinary, unambitious family man. But for the first time in my life, I realized that in a war, there were no bystanders. There was no neutrality. Is it fair to say that when you wrote this and then when you decided to, you know, to, to appear for the IAS and, uh, and, and you know, get, join the IAS, that you took a stand? I took a position hmm. that 
this needs to stop. You what put has, your faith in the Indian state at that time? What has been happening, mm. look, my belief is that we need to engage with the Indian state. Mm. I am operating in a space, mm. a legislative, a constitutional, a mm. law and order, a political mm. space, mm. which is defined by Indian constitution at the moment. Mm. What I am saying is that what else do I do? I have to engage whatever we need to get, mm. we need to get from the Indian state first. So you took a stand then? I took a stand then. Today, in 2019? I am taking a stand again. And Are you changing that Absolutely stand? not. That stand continues. As a civil servant, the work which I have been doing hmm. is fundamentally a work related to developmental issues. Hmm. Hmm. But I am saying that I am enlarging my argument. I am saying that it's a political crisis in the making. Hmm. I have been working with politicians so far, but the kind of political vacuum which hmm. is in the state at the moment, hmm. we need to do something about that. Right. I am joining electoral politics. I have not disengaged from the system. You talked about hope to begin with. Am I abandoning that hope? I am not. I am using the existing institutions. I am enlarging my argument. I am saying that I am going to engage with the existing institutions. I am going to use the democratic method for bringing some sort of political respite to the place. What makes you confident of being successful? And pardon me if I am sounding so cynical, but what makes you so optimistic uh, where other political parties uh, in the mainstream space have not managed to move anywhere. I am a staunch believer in the futility of war. I know that the war is not going to solve this issue, hmm. number one. Number second, I am a strong believer that democratic space hmm. can be utilized for getting solutions to that place. Now you are asking me why existing parties have failed hmm. and what kind of new politics am, am I trying to create. So it's basically about compromises. What kind of compromises are we ready to make? Hmm. What kind of compromised politics are we ready to run? I have come into politics after giving up something. Hmm. I'm not an accidental politician. I have made a choice of doing politics in a conflict zone hmm. where I know I can be killed anytime. It's my optimism that my engagement with the youth, my understanding, my communication with the youth, which has been happening for the last 10 years, hmm. that has given me that hope that we can still make things work in Kashmir, believe me. It may sound kind of idealistic, it may sound kind of foolishness. Or hopeful. Or too much hope, yeah, too much idealism, too much of youth maybe in me. But my engagement with the youth for the last 10 years has made me realize that people want to resolve issues peacefully. We, we, are, we are staunch believers in dialogue. Kashmiris, are not, Kashmiris still continue to be the people mm. who used to be scared of calling a chicken. Mm. It's the desperation of the times, the desperation of the circumstances, really, which has pushed Kashmiris and to the Kashmiris wall. And Kashmiris themselves are paying with their blood, isn't it? Whether it was your father, whether it was Shujaat Bukhari recently, whether it was victims, JNK cops. The biggest victims. Uh, you know, uh, they are the target of who gets killed? terrorists, stroke you have militants. People who, you have people who did their PhDs hmm. from, from hmm. big universities hmm. in the country hmm. and then got killed. Why are they getting killed? What kind of loss is that? Whose loss is that? Hmm. Who are those people who are mourning in Kashmir? Hmm. What does, don't Kashmiri mothers and daughters and sisters, don't they count? Who are those soldiers who lost their lives? Are we just going to listen to it and look at it and continuously, you know, kind of look at these statistics, at statistics and then just do nothing about them? Hmm. My belief is that this war has to end. Hmm. We need to go back to the people, start that conversation again. Hmm. Confrontation is not going to work, Con conversation is going to work. In December, we had Sajjad Lone of the JNK People's Conference make his bid to position himself as an alternative to the mainstream parties. Uh, he made a very interesting point. His point is a Kashmiri doesn't wake up every day and uh, think about conflict and politics. He thinks about how to get his rosy roti. I think I do not agree with that position. Clearly not. I believe that in Kashmir, the fundamental question is of survival today. There is an existential threat in Kashmir. Hmm. I was doing my job very happily. Hmm. There are people who were posted, who were appointed in police, who are hmm. doing good jobs, who had good qualifications to get any post hmm. anywhere in the country. Hmm. It doesn't work that way. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crisis. It's a political crisis in Kashmir. People are telling me today in thousands, hmm. do not give us development, do not give us jobs. Hmm. Please do something about the safety of life first. Please do something about de-escalation of tensions in Kashmir. So initially, maybe 10 years back, 10 years ago, I also believed that let's give development to people and Kashmir will be quiet, believe me. 70,000 crores we gave last year, 80,000 crores. Give us another 100,000 crores, 
things are still going to be bad unless we make any political initiative towards Kashmiris. This is my staunch belief that unless we revive the political process and restore those conversations which have been happening, we have seen moments of calm in Kashmir. I think yeah. in our life, lifetimes we have seen many, just yeah. four to five years back, yeah. Kashmir Around used to be, 13. there was still hope in Kashmir. Why can't we kind of revive those conversations? When you talk about um, engaging with the separatists, someone like Yasin Malik has called you a new agent of Delhi. Uh, the BJP has called you a proxy of the separatists. I really liked it. Basically, it reflects the neutrality, uh, the position which I have taken where both sides are pushing me back. So both sides believe that I do not have agency on the, resp on the actions that I am taking. Mm. Now, this, is how, this is how things happen in conflict zone. This is what worries me basically that in a conflict zone, you are forced to take sides. You talked about Nidhi's uh, uh, excerpt uh, from her book. So this is about taking that position that you are literally forced to take position. Mm. And no position is a position in itself. So even if you are a bystander, mm. you will get so much pushback from both sides mm. that you create a position of your own and you become vulnerable in your own sense. Let us say you do contest elections as you seem to plan to. Yeah. Uh, how do you see that role play out if you were to, to experience electoral success? You know, why? my, my theory, mm. my hypothesis about Kashmir presently is mm. that uh, if we are this time in a phase of intense violence, mm. it's because we have either negated mm. the non-violent means of expression mm. or discredited them. Mm. So my belief is that if those realities about Kashmir, crisis that the youngsters are facing, the problem of militarization, the problem of unknown gunmen, mm. the problem of violence against women, mm. the problem of Kashmiri pundits, mm. if we can articulate these these facts about, these hard facts about Kashmir mm. in a democratic way. Mm. My belief is that there will be absolutely no need for violence in Kashmir. If, suppose there was a dialogue process which has been going for, on for the last 70 years. Mm. If we are ready to respect that dialogue process, not that we send an interlocutor, we send a negotiator, he produces a report, we throw that report in the dustbin. Mm. If that doesn't happen, mm. believe me, the violence can be curbed. So we've heard Omar Abdullah and Mehbooba Mufti uh, make statements. We've heard all you guys on social media, uh, you know, Kashmiris who have a voice on social media and in the media, mainstream media, make an appeal to the government, make an appeal to state governments to offer security to Kashmiris. Shah Fazal, if you were to make an appeal that would really connect with people, people who are not hoodlums, people who are not politicians looking to, uh, you know, benefit or profit from this, people who are not thugs, if you were to reach out to people uh, who understand what you would say at an intellectual level but also feel resentment that Kashmiris want Indians to open up their hearts and minds but that love is not reciprocated at all when they do and Kashmiris tend to look at India as India and Indians, right? How do you talk to these people to understand why it is important to safeguard Kashmiris? If, I mean, if you have to make I, I that totally appeal, what agree. would your appeal and be? Honestly speaking, I won't deny that even in these days of crisis, we have seen tremendous solidarity coming from the people of India. Mm. So my appeal will not be to the officers of India. It will not be to the politicians of India. Mm. It will not be to the hoodlum and the, and the bully element. Mm. It will be to the people of India that if you really feel like that we need to reach out to people, this is the time when you can possibly show Kashmiris that you belong to us. Let's humanize the narrative about Kashmir mm. in the rest of the country. Mm. There's a martyr in your family, there's a martyr in your village. There's a crisis, similar crisis, there's a similar killing. There's a similar mourning happening in Kashmir. Can these people come together? Can we stop this violence and this hatred? Can soldiers, you know, stop being forced to be carrying the cross of the politician? Can Kashmir stop being a uh, a vote bank kind of issue in the rest of the country. I mean, these are the issues which are for the consideration of the people of India. I wish this kind of hatred, this kind of targeted mm. uh, violence against a certain community, this kind of alienation. The people of country realize that your enemies are out to basically, they want you to do the same thing. And you're getting played in the hands of your enemies. Please don't do this. If you had to give a message to young men like Adir Ahmad Dar, what would it be? 
My message to Kashmiris is that we don't need to lose hope in the humanity. Mm. I think it's finally the humanity, the non-violence, the ability to engage with people that's finally going to help us in solving our issues. We need to reach out our, to our people and, and we don't have, we don't, we can't allow our humanity to be snatched. Mm. Mm. That's important. When you decided finally to drop you know, to, to quit the IS. Was it a difficult decision where your family was concerned and where people of Kashmir were concerned because you were the role model? And even for India, isn't it? You... It was very hard to convince maybe my mother. Hmm. She has experienced violence in her own life and faced a tragedy, so it was very hard for her to realize that her son is also hmm. going into a space which is very risky. Hmm. But then it took me a couple of years to convince my wife my mother, my friends, that I need to do this. I need to bring spotlight maybe to the crisis in Kashmir, which is only possible if I speak out. And this is nothing to do with any personal ambition. You're Absolutely okay not. with the sacrifices and the ultimate I'm sacrifices okay. it's that going might to be, come yeah, this Obviously, route. it's like, it's a huge struggle. I know it's going to be a huge risk. I've lost my job, all the privileges which, which come with it. And I, I'm operating in a space where this side is saying that he is your agent and this side is saying he is your agent. Mm. So it's going to be very risky, but that's how life is. I think I'm ready for those risks. Shah Faisal, we wish you a lot of good luck. You're standing up to be counted. Thank you. And that's always, it's always difficult. It's always doubted. It's always risky. It's always uh, risky, but we wish you luck because you. it's only optimism that and hope that yeah, you absolutely. know the world rests on it and runs on absolutely. it. Absolutely. Um, but uh, you can go only when we when you give us a piece of music that's special to you or that you could play on a loop. I listen to a lot of Coke Studio, but hmm. I would recommend "Kuch To Log Kahenge." Logo ka kaam hai kehna. Shah Faisal, good luck. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.